Welcome back to MedTweet this week, where I talk about my favorite tweets of the week. I have a great guest for you today and some great tweets, so catch you after the intro. All right, welcome back. So I want to share my favorite tweet of the week. It's from Dr. Patrick Fadden, and it says here, hashtag physical exam, hashtag tutorial, at VCU I am res. So cardiac auscultation is all about identifying normal from abnormal sounds. Like any skill, this takes practice. In 1904, Dr. Charles W. Larned, is it Larned? Published how, how to mimic heart sounds. Here is how to practice without a patient or even a heart. And so it, he goes on to discuss um, a couple different uh, ways in which you can sort of practice this at home without even having a patient. But instead of just me going through this, I do encourage everyone to look at this tweet and um, you can probably see a little bit of it here. But I have Dr. Patrick Fadden with me. Hey, how are you doing? Good. Thanks for having me on. No problem. No problem. Thank you for spending the time to um, come on the show today. Um, so I guess I, I first want to start off with why did, why did you decide to bring out this tweet now and like what, what were sort of the circumstances that made you thinking about wanting to present this? Yeah, um, so this was a this was something I was taught actually back in residency. Um, I never been taught how to mimic the heart sounds uh, in, in you know, the preclinical years or even during my clerkships. I think I was a second year resident at the VA that I work at now. Um, and Dr. Frank Falco was my attending and he showed me how to mimic the aortic um, stenosis murmur and then the holosystolic murmur. And I thought this was so fascinating. It was almost unreal how closely you could make the, the, the normal sounds. And uh, I just was baffled that I hadn't learned it before. And I just thought that maybe I had not been, I, I was like the only one, I guess. Um, but then, you know, I, uh, finished residency. I'm, I'm working at the same VA now, um, and I do a lot of physical exam teaching. Um, and every time I bring this you know, maneuver up, uh, I get the same shock and awe from medical students, from residents, even cardiology fellows. Uh, so I thought maybe it was time to, you know, put together a tutorial and, and show the world. Um, this is not a new thing by any means, as as you can see from the tutorial. Uh, this is well known. Uh, I just think it's funny. I didn't know any about uh, when this was discovered. It was only actually in re uh, research for the tutorial that I found this paper. Um, and he actually, and Dr. Larned, uh, preferred the hand over the ear method, which looked something like this, where you put your oh, I see, right I see. hand over your ear and reach around to the to the top of your right hand with your left hand and mimic the heart sounds that way. He also liked the stethoscope on the chest, but not over the heart and just palpating over the chest. Oh, I see, I it. see. So it was actually a friend of his, that, a colleague that showed him the stethoscope in the hand technique. And he didn't prefer that because the sounds are too intense for the S1 and S2. Um, but that's definitely the one that, that I learned and the one that I feel like is probably the most practical. Well, I have to say that I was, this year old minus a couple of days when I learned this, <laughs> you know, like, um, you know, I remember when I was a medical student and um, I think, you know, I did some board review classes too. I mean, when you do this, you know, they have, uh, you know, you just, you know, some MP3s that are playing some of the heart sounds. And I'm listening to them and usually, usually they sound very made up and non-organic. Yeah. And, and, you know, as soon as I saw this, I literally took my stethoscope and I did it. I was like, and it sound like it doesn't sound artificial which I think then lends credence to actually understanding this a little better. Yeah, um, absolutely. So you, and the, you, the paper actually goes on to um, just to describe more than just the heart sounds that I, that I provided um, like mitral stenosis and so forth. So there's, there's more out there that you can actually mimic. Excellent. So I, is there, so besides your tutorial, is there some other resource that people can, I mean, are you going to partner up with Andre Mansour and get this on, on onto his uh, his website or what? I'm not sure about that. Um, that would be awesome. <laughs> um, but um, but yeah, I'm de definitely looking forward to that resource. Uh, I, I think that his his um, his video is actually really. He was one of the first people I started following on Twitter actually, um, because I think some of those resources showing those to residents. Um, and med medical students at the bedside are super helpful to teach the physical exam. Um, 
But uh, some of the other resources I like to use for physical exam would be the Stanford 25 uh, series. They have a great um, YouTube channel with uh, lots of different uh, videos to, to explore. Um, and then um, uh, if, if folks are interested in learning more about the physical exam, uh, they, have a, uh, they actually have a um, conference every year, um, two days out at uh, Stanford, where you can go and actually learn more of these practical skills. And, um, and that's actually where I, I, th that was uh, another place that kind of reminded me about this um, uh, cardiac mimic, um, because that's how they taught some of the cardiac sounds. So you've gone to this, the Stanford, is it a workshop or conference? Yeah, it's a two day, um, it's a workshop skills development conference. Uh, I went last year and I hope to go again this year. Um, it was fantastic. It was, it was one of the best conferences I've been to. Um, it really kind of gets the clinical educator excited about the physical exam again um, and t teaches not just new techniques and, and hone in on our own skills at the exam, but also how to teach the physical exam. Um, and I think that's that's one thing that as a clinical educator, I've been kind of more interested in and I've been trying to perfect my exam. Um, and I think that will be, uh, you know, ever uh, a career worthy goal, but um, but also being able to teach it in a reasonable manner. And uh, it's a, so many great uh, teaching points from from those guys um, that I, you can bring back home to your institution right away. Cool, cool. I think one thing that struck me about, especially the way you're teaching here, um, or at least one technique of teaching here, is the fact that, you know, right now we're sort of in the time of COVID. And so the, the biggest issue for me is, you know, we recently at my institution only just recently got med students back onto our clinical services, um, especially inpatient. And right now, while we're physical distancing and also trying to minimize exposures for my students, I still want to teach them physical exam skills, but how can I sort of shift some area where we can sort of maybe do some simulation and practice before I was like, okay, so this is what a murmur might sound like that we know on this patient. And so when we're in with the patient, we can minimize how much we're grouping around them or, yeah. or even time within the patient room so they can really listen and be like, oh, that's what I heard. And then we can move on. So um, these types of things, I think we're all going to have to think of different ways in which we're, we're teaching these physical exam skills too. Cause you know, I don't even know if, especially in our med school, I, I don't know what we're doing with our standardized patients, OSCEs. I don't know what different medical mm -hmm. schools are doing around the, the nation. And I'm sure it's got to be something different. And there needs to be some rethought on how this is going to happen. Because, you know, even if the pandemic goes away, there still may be other things in the future. Or maybe this is just an impetus to, to, for innovation so that we can continue to work on other ways of teaching physical exam outside the traditional methods but which we, we've been taught. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I actually don't know what the landscape will look like in the next few months for, for me as well. Um, I traditionally do a lot of bedside rounding um, and it's been a little bit more of a table rounding and then going to see the new patients or the critically ill patients. We don't actually have medical students back yet. They'll be back in a few months. Um, but yeah, I think that, that, that dynamic that I had going will definitely be different. And I'm not exactly sure how um that's all gonna gonna fit but it definitely will be uh, a challenge well, i think that's something we're all we're all learning on so you know i'm sure i'm i'll continue to follow you on on twitter and if you if you come up with any best practices i'd be more than happy to to, to see them and retweet okay okay right, perfect <laughs> um is there anything else you want to let me know about before i start telling other uh, some of my honorable mentions for tweets this week um yeah i guess i, I had a, a kind of thoughts on other um other exam fi findings that I, I found not to be the in the traditional um, grouping of med student teaching like Bates and so forth uh, yeah. that I've picked up along the way. Okay. Um, uh, and some of this is from actually my exposure to the Stanford curriculum and then also uh, the Society of Bedside Medicine. But um, there's this uh, one of my other favorite exam uh, findings to point out is the Frank sign. Have you heard of this one? It's the diagonal earlobe crease. Right, right. Um, so this is the one where if folks have uh, obstructive cardiac disease, um, you take a look at their earlobes and it could be a, a partial crease um, on one side or, or a full crease on one side or both sides. But 
Um, it seems to suggest uh, that they have uh, structural coronary disease, especially in folks that are on the younger side. Um, and I, I find that fascinating because I, I don't know, for me, I, I find it to be the likelihood is like 40, but it's really probably around two to three. Um, but I just find at the VA, everyone has Frank sign. Um, and it's just kind of a fun thing because medical students typically don't know about that and residents may, may know about that, but, uh, that's a, that's a fun one to teach. Now, have you, have you ever gone to the national ACP conference? Uh, yeah, I have actually, so, that's where I, I've discovered some of the, uh, these other, uh, conferences in the society of bedside medicine actually. Gotcha. Gotcha. Have you ever gone to the session that, um, is it Sal Mangione does on, um, he does like some like history, sort of a lot of history of medicine, but he's got a, a, a great session where he goes through like a bunch of different paintings and does like, mm. and he's like, there's Frank Stein. And I think he had a whole portion about like looking at the Mona Lisa and it, it's fantastic. I think there are versions of it on YouTube, which I'll try to link below if I can find it. So I'll link it below. Um, but um, I'll, yeah. So um, I'll, if, if you get a chance to check the, check that out should, um, in the yeah. future, um, but I'll, I'll share that well, I was just going to say that's like one of the uh, kind of fun things about the physical exam is that there's always a history to it. And so someone discovered it sometime. And, and um, that's that's part of, um, I think, why I like to talk uh, about, you know, I've only done two tutorials, but trying to like layer in some history to it, I think, gives context and, and kind of interest to to why we do the things we do, I guess. Fantastic. Well, I really appreciate your tweet this, this time because I really learned a lot and I can't wait to, to understand this better so that I can um, have another tool in my toolbox to teach my learners. Perfect. So I'm going to go quickly through some of my favorite tweets from this week. So my, my first honorable mention of the week isn't exactly just a tweet, although it, it did come from a couple of different people, including Travis Smith and Avi Cooper. But I don't know if you guys knew, but Avi Cooper... Tony Brew and Hannah Abrams, they started a new podcast called The Curious Clinicians, and that came out within the last week. And I think, um, well, where it's recording, to, where, where I'm recording today, episode two just went out. So please, please, please download them. I think they hit number five in Apple Podcasts on, in medicine uh, already, and they're obviously fantastic people, and it's just great to learn from them. So I want to encourage everyone to check that out. Another one of my favorite tweets includes ones from um, Navin Kumar which he had a great um, a, a GI tutorial about small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So I encourage people to check that one out. Um, and then talking about some of my, um, they're less fun tweets, but I think they're interesting. So Dr. Ray Bignall, um, he had a tweet. It was about a, a Wired article that he was, um, he was, his words were featured in about discussing health disparities in America and that actually telemedicine doesn't, Help health, uh, help health disparities, but actually may widen them. And I think that's something that many of my colleagues have noticed early on. Um, in fact, it was an issue that even before COVID-19, as we were rolling out telemedicine within our own institution, was an issue that we had brought up multiple times. Um, it wasn't, but it really has come into focus in the middle of everything else that's going on now. So I really encourage people to check out that tweet and the article that was linked by Dr. Bignell. So I think those are my favorite tweets of the week. Um, now, Patrick, do you have anything that you want to showcase or, or tell people you liked? Um, nothing uh, specifically. I guess the, I, I did really enjoy your last um, uh, tutorial overview with Dr. Nora. Um, I thought that was, that was definitely worth a listen. Um, and then I'm really just enjoying a lot of the virtual morning report, um, clinical problem solver, um, tutorials um, from Travis Smith and, and Marie. Um, I think they're doing an exceptional job and it's really at the point of care learning. Uh, and I enjoy saving those and, and bringing them up on rounds and looking like I'm the smartest doctor. Yeah. Amazing. But, and, you know, it's, and I, and I've, I've seen now that several times they've even had just medical student specific, um, Mm -hmm. um, morning reports just so that there was sort of a safer spot for them to be able to uh, work through their diagnostic skills. So um, I think I've, I'm sure it's been mul uh, mentioned multiple times on, on this show, but I, if you haven't checked it out, please check it out. I will link to the CP solvers below and every time they have a more virtual morning report, check it out. They have a YouTube channel, which isn't uh, used a whole bunch for these, but they do have all their videos on their website. So please check it out. 
Well, I think that brings us to the end of our discussion here. I want to thank you so much for spending the time this week to talk to me. And I really look forward to seeing your further tweets. Excellent. Thanks for having me on. All right. Do you have anything else you want to plug before we go? Um, no, I think we're good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for following along. Um, the podcasts are now distributed on multiple other platforms, including Spotify and uh, Pocket Cast, and including Anchor as well. It will be on Apple iTunes soon, I hope, um, but it's also on YouTube. And obviously, you can see this here on Periscope and on Twitter. So please like, subscribe, follow, do all the fun stuff, comment. I encourage open discussion. So see you guys in the next one. Bye.